Okay, so we left off last week talking about the N over Z ratio. That's neutrons over protons. Now, basically what this means is that every element has a happy zone ratio. It's kind of like the Goldilocks zone, like, you know, where the earth is, if the earth was like a mile over, we'd all be dead and either too cold or too warm. It's got to be in the perfect Goldilocks, just right kind of thing. Same thing works with elements where they have to be in this perfect balance of neutrons to proton ratio based on what we talked about last week being the nuclear forces involved with the stabilization of the nucleus. So if the N over Z ratio is too high, meaning there's too many neutrons, and that kind of pushes the protons together, making a lot of um, unhappy forces and causing um, the nucleus to explode and be radioactive, what happens is when it does become radioactive, beta decay will occur. And this is, remember what beta decay is, you're basically ejecting an electron that's very high energy. And that electron comes from the conversion of neutrons to protons. So the neutron is releasing its negative charge in the form of a beta particle. And then what's left over is a positive charge. And that positive charge is the proton that was converted from the neutron. Okay. Let's make sure, make sure you guys can see it. All right, good. Um, all right, so that's if it's too high. If it's too low, the N over Z ratio, meaning there's too many protons and not enough neutrons to buffer, what likes to happen is positron emission or electron capture. They're, they're the same thing. Electron capture is gaining a negative. Positron emission is losing a positive. So numerically, they do the same thing. But a positron emission is most likely going to happen. And that means when a proton is converted to a neutron. So you have the proton, the positive charge leaves the proton, and then it becomes via the, via the positron, and then it becomes a neutron. So the N over Z ratio will increase. One proton will go away. One neutron will appear or one neutron will, neutron happens, will increase by one. What happens during a positron emission? Like, is there any sort of physical reaction or is it just like chemical? Oh, the internally. So one of the subatomic particles in a proton. So a proton's actually split up into three quarks that are plus one third each. So by some physics reaction, some quantum physical reaction, those quarks give their positive charge to a positron or to an electron sized particle. And then that is emitted or, or energy. And that is emitted from the proton. So um, that's really, that, that's what happens. And the cause of that is just a, a low N over Z ratio, which causes an instability in the nucleus. So that's a good question. Um, okay, so moving on. So here's this valley of stability. So uh, depending on your atomic number and what element we're talking about, there's a certain happy zone ratio. And there's, there's a couple of them. And there's a reason why there's a couple of them for each atomic number is because of the different isotopes, right? Not every element has one isotope. Some of them do, like fluorine is monoisotopic. But most of them, especially the heavier ones, they have multiple isotopes that are considered to be stable. Um, since so for N over, for sorry, Z greater than 83. So that's an important number, 83. Remember that one. So any element that's heavier than, or any element that's larger than atomic number 83, so 84 and so forth, is radioactive regardless. So what's 82? 82 is lead, right? So anything after lead, remember that, anything after lead is radioactive. Now, some of them might be more stable than others, meaning the half-life might be 100 years or 1,000 years, but they're all radioactive and they're not stable, um, like we consider hydrogen and helium and, and carbon to be stable. Is it greater than 83 or greater than an, or equal to? Greater than 83, not equal to. So any, anything higher than lead. So okay. lead's not radioactive. So yes, Christina. No, 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 no. So, so you don't have to you don't have to memorize n over z ratios specifically. Yeah, don't worry about that. Good question. Right. Yes. And then they go up. I, they go up kind of linearly, right? Um, and they kind of diverge from this linearity, though. Um, and that's because of. It's not. It's it's like a. It's it's still linear, but it's not a one to one linear. 
It's at a higher slope. Um, and that's because when you have more protons, a lot more, not uh, more neutrons are favored, but more than a one-to-one -one amount of neutrons are favored because you want more buffer between those higher number of protons. So it just kind of works that way. But in terms of numbers to memorize, the only one greater than 83 for your atomic number, atomic numbers being non-stable. Okay, so the, again, these magic numbers. So, so basically there's different combinations that do affect the stability and, and, and they kind of like uh, reach critical points in the ratios. So, but again, this is kind of like a little bit beyond, you don't have to memorize all of them, but let's just, we can just talk about it. So um, most of them, most of the nuclei, the stable ones, have an even number of protons and neutrons. So for example, well, I mean, even number. So the number of them that have even number of both that are stable is 157. And think of, if you think about, oh, professor, aren't there only 118 atom or elements? Yes, there are. But counting in all the isotopes, there's over 300 or 200 that are, well, more than that. There's actually a lot more. There's thousands of isotopes. But in terms of stable ones, there's only about uh, 260 stable ones. Um, so out of those stable ones, 157 of them have an even protons and even neutrons. And then, uh, well, basically to get to the, the trend, an odd number of protons and odd number of neutrons is unfavored in stability. Why? Because of physics. No, I'm not going to go crazy about that. But that's why they call it magic numbers. It's not really magic. It's just quantum physics, but we're not going to go into that. And I don't even, I can't even tell you the equations that go into it, um, and into figuring that out. But of, of course, the age old answer that I always say, it has to do with what's energetically more favorable. So um, that has something to do with it. Um, okay, so decay series. So sometimes we're not gonna go crazy about this, but um, the way elements decay. So let's say you have an element that has an atomic number over 83. There's gonna be a specific series of decays that it goes through in order to get to under 83. Um, in some cases, it may be one alpha decay. In some cases, it may be alpha, beta, 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 alpha, 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 and it'll eventually get there into the stable zone. And that's just indicative of, of what element it is. I mean, it is, that's just a, that's a thing. Just, just know that. And it's called a decay series. So a conceptual question. So a nuclide has a mass number of 116. So nuclide just means a specific isotope or a specific nucleus of the isotope, right? Um, so a specific number of protons and neutrons has a mass number of 116, meaning they're all 116 if you add them up. The atomic mass of the element listed in the periodic table is 103, let's say. Will the element undergo beta decay or positron emission? So they're both the same element. So you have the element as the average atomic mass is 103. This isotope happens to be all the way up to 116. So what can we say about it? In terms of N over Z, in terms of neutrons or protons specifically, do they have the same number of protons? Yes, they do. So Rebecca, unfortunately, you had 50-50 shot. B is not. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is A. Good. Were you thinking A, Christina? Okay, cool. Right. So the reason why it's A is because the only way, so they both have the same number of protons. The only way for the, the 116 to be heavier is it has more neutrons. And if it has more neutrons, that means it's too many neutrons. And if it wants to be stable again, then it's going to, it's, if you want to see my cursor, it's in this beta decay region where the N over Z ratio is above the line of stability. So let's say protons are, we don't know how many protons, let's say it's like right here where the protons plus the neutrons equal hundred. So it's like right here. Well, let's, let's make this a little bigger. Oh, you guys can't see that. I'm not, no, you guys can see that. But I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't like hybrid. Okay, you could, this is, there we go. 
That's good. Quick. All right. So um, let's say we're at 40 right here, 50, 45, and 50-ish. That's like 100. So if you're 116 with the same number of protons, you're all the way up here. The only way to get down is beta decay. So that's what's going to happen. So the answer is beta decay. Okay. So um, different ways to measure radioactivity. Um, there's a thermoluminescent dosimeter, and um, that's one way. And the most, but whatever, that's one way you can read about it. But the uh, most common way is a Geiger counter, which you probably heard of. So the way it works is it counts electrons from argon that's in the air. So argon, remember in back in Chem 1, when we went over the components of air, you have mostly nitrogen, then you have oxygen's number two, and then you have, what the hell, argon's number three, right? It's not CO2, it's not hydrogen, it's argon. So argon's an inert gas, it's a noble gas, right? It's just in our air, it doesn't really do anything to us, but um, we can use it to our benefit. We can use it by, we can calculate the ionization of argon, because argon is not supposed to ionize by itself. It only ionizes in high radiation or high energy situations. So if something is in the air that's strong enough to ionize it, that means pr most likely that thing has to be radioactive. So we can detect these with a Geiger counter and using an anode and a cathode like this. And the way they're ionized is they become positively charged because an electron is, they're, they're hit with radiation energy and that energy releases an electron from the argon, which makes it positively charged. And that positively charged, those argons will go to the cathode and then we'll be able to detect the signal. So that can be used to detect radiation. And then we have a scintillation counter, which um, we, we, I mean specifically, but not me specifically, but um, in biology and biochemistry, we use scintillation counters for some radioactive types of experiments. But we can do this, we can achieve the same things with fluorescence and it's a lot safer. That's just another way to do it. Um, so now we're talking about uh, half-life, which is the really the only huge concept concept left in chapter 21. And half-life in a radioactive sense, what it means is not back when we talked about half-life in first order and second order and zero order equations or chemical reactions, we talked about the concentrations to so the molarities. We talked about molarities of solutions or molarities of reactants products increasing or decreasing and the reactant would decrease by half its original value which means the time it took to do that was the half-life you would solve for t and you would find the half-life but in this case we're not talking about concentration because we're dealing with real masses we're dealing with a brick of of uranium well, hopefully you're not but somebody's dealing with a brick of uranium and we're trying to figure out, all right, what's the half-life of this uranium? So, all right, we'll, we'll do some mass spec on it. We'll see, all right, it's mostly uranium. And then after 2000 years, it will be, all right, there's some plutonium in there or there's some lead in there. That means most, some of it decayed. Now, the half-life is the time it takes for the original amount to decrease by half of its original isotopic amount. So it, it decays, the mass doesn't go anywhere. Well, technically it does. But the mass doesn't disappear. It transforms mostly into more stable isotopes. That's, where, that's what we mean by this, um, this radioactive decay. And also, on a, unlike chemical reactions, there's no temperature change in uh, that, or there's no, let me rephrase that. There's the rate of radioactive change is unaffected by temperature, as far as we know. And also pressure. Wait, high pressures, it's affected, but low, like anything above like 100 atm, it's significantly affected. Um, okay, so kinetics, it's a first order decay, meaning it decays in the kind of logarithmic fashion. So natural log fashion, so natural log of two over k is how you figure out your half life. And We've seen this equation before and it'll be given again. And that's how you, using a rate constant, we can calculate our half-life. 
But the way we're going to do it in radioactivity is we're not going to really use a rate constant um, per se. Usually we do that in chapter 15. But we like to use graphs and we like to use actual real life examples and, and mass examples to calculate half-life. So um, before that, we could say that when it's common terminology, or oh, chapter 16, sorry, Tariq. Um, see, I'm losing it. Really, chapter 16? Okay, fine. Um, oh, you can't read the chat anymore? Well, that's the, the downfall of coming to class is you, you can't see the chat anymore. Well, can't you have it up on the screen over there? Yeah. Oh, well, don't you, you have a screen right there. Can you pull up the Zoom? You could. Oh, oh, you have no charger? Oh, okay. Oh, it is 15. Yeah, I'm, I, I knew I'm, see? I, I know things. I know things. Um, okay, so when you have a shorter half-life, we use the term hotter, that, that it's a hotter nuclei. Um, and usually in, in, in my field, in biochemistry, when something is labeled with radioactivity or labeled with a fluorescent label, we say it's a hot, a hot ligand or a hot compound, meaning that's the thing that's going to be detected. So they use the same terminology in radioactivity. So here's some examples of different half-lives of some nuclei. I was trying to make it bigger for the people in the room, but that just failed miserably. Undo that. There we go. So half-lives of various nuclei, you have all over, they're all over the place, really. I mean, uh, the, the one we like to see is carbon-14. So carbon-14 is used in carbon-14 dating. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But that is a type of beta decay. And it takes 5,700 years for a sample of carbon-14 to decrease by half of its original mass. And then you have other ones like uranium-238 and thorium-232, which they're used to... Uh, for dating of geological samples like meteorites and different kinds of rocks to see how old the earth is. So the earth is approximately 4 billion years old and that's about the same half-life as uranium-238. So that's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, those are mostly alpha, alpha decays. So usually the another thing is, well, I'll let you guys answer this question. You notice how the only one that's beta decay is carbon-14. The other ones are all alpha decay. And they're all, uh, well, why do you think that? Don't worry about the half-life so much. It's not really a trend there, because it just happens. It depends on how far it, off, far it is off of the line of stability for the half-life. But why do you think those elements and not carbon-14 have alpha? Uh, it's been a while since I picked someone in a classroom to answer a question. So Sebastian's hands up, hands up with hand. hand was up first. Yeah, yeah, exactly it. So they're bigger, they're a lot bigger, right? And the reason why in heavier elements, when they go through um, decay, they do have a lot more neutrons, they have more protons and enough that they can easily and energetically favorably get rid of them. And another thing is the, really the main answer is because they're over 83. So you were hinting at that, but their proton number is over 83, which means that very uh, rapidly, well, they wanna get to, they wanna decay enough to where their proton number is under 83 as fast as possible. And the best way to do that is alpha decay because you're removing four neutrons and, four, and uh, two protons at a, a time. So maybe the first two or three iterations of their decay series will be alpha decay. And then they'll eventually switch over to beta decay. Yes, 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 yes. Good, good analogy. Yeah. I had to think about that one for a minute. All right. All right. So now here's graphically how we would determine a half-life. So um, let's say if you didn't know the half-life, it's written here as a minute. You can look, all right, the original sample at time zero was a million. And then at time one, it's 500,000. So, hey, that's the half-life. And then in another half-life, we go from 500,000 to 250, 250 to 125, 125 to 62, blah, 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 et cetera. And it'll go logarithmic, log, bleh, logarithmic, 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 wait. 
yeah, logarithmic. Wait, logarithmic. That's how you say the word. I I slipped up because I think my tongue hit my mask, or, and it just like it like jumbled up my uh, my words. All right, I'm cut. I'm gonna cut that one out. All right. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll clap. Yeah, we'll do that. All right. How'd you know that? Oh, it is? Oh, it's right here. Oh, Christina's like, she's just she's just asserting her senator dominance here by saying that, oh, isn't radon exactly 55.6 seconds? And I'm like, because she just saw it in the previous slide. You, you have all the knowledge. Yeah. All right, so consider the graph representing the nuclear radioactive decay of this nuclide. What is the radioactive, what is the half-life of it? I can't read today. And we have an answer, Brian and Tariq, B. B is the correct answer, yes. Good, because I counted eight spots, eight blocks. When you get to four blocks, it's 1,250 years. Cool, so all right, good, we got half-life, all right. All right, so we have a question. Yep, happy my nuclear, exactly, good. All right, so radioactive decay, like I said before, it's a first order process that follows this first order equation, which we've seen before from reaction. So we have natural log of the total amount of atoms or mass divided by the initial amount of mass equals negative KT. So um, we can solve that to make a first order integrated rate law in essence, um, but this equation, if needed, will be given to you. So you can determine from the initial or final values and the rate constant, what is the half-life, or really what is from, from the rate constant, what the half-life is. And you could do that anyway from the simplified equation shown before, which was this one. So, all right, cool. And that's basically, this, this equation is the same thing, but the general form of it, if we weren't talking about half-life is this because all they do for the half-life one is set n equal to two, n equal to two and nt equal to one. Oh no, sorry, nt, n, yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, next one. A sample initially contains 1.6 moles of radioactive isotope. Which of the sample, wait, didn't say which, how much of the sample remains after four half-lives? So, Let's see who can answer this. We have answers all over the place. Um, Christina, you have your hand up. Yes, it is, and everyone concurs. It is B. B, all right, we get it. There's a lot of Bs there. <laughs> well, you guys are carrying the classroom. There's not much competition, but. Right side, left side of my perspective. All right, so yes, I was like, no, the answer is C. No, <laughs> no, answer is B. So yeah, one half life point eight, two half lives point four, three half lives point two, four half lives point one. So we get the point. All right, so radioactive dating. Um, that's what Tinder's for. Get it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so radiocarbon dating. That was a good joke, right? I'm gonna leave that in there. Make sure all your dates are radioactive. <laughs> all right, so the, for carbon-14 dating, it's one of the most common ways of dating uh, biological samples that are, we consider ancient, like archeological samples, let's say old, old writings. Because writings, what they are, they're on paper, and paper is made of wood, it's organic material. Same for bones, same for um, even pieces of, well, like tools, old tools that were made of tree. Because think about it, most tools that were ancient, they were had some kind of either bone, uh, rope, or something that was derived from tree matter, or not rocks, that's not, but like, you know, um, something alive at one point, plants, whatever. So we can use carbon-14 dating to date some of these. And how do we do that? We, while 
things are still alive. So while we're producing, right now we are taking in hundreds of moles of CO2, or no, or we're expelling hundreds of moles of CO2 a day. And we're taking in hundreds of moles of oxygen a day. So if you wanna lose weight, just stop breathing. and You won't, you won't take in as, much, as many moles of oxygen. Um, but what this means is that all your metabolic processes are moving. And the carbon in your body, the each specific atom, the let's say, let's call them remember the microstates. Also, a cure for hiccups. Stop breathing. Well, that's a cure in more than one ways for hiccups. <laughs> um, so, what was I saying? While you're going through life, you you keep uh, replenishing your carbon, right? Because your cells die, they replenish whatever. You get your carbon from the outside world. So, your body is a living sample of replenishing carbon which has about the same abundance of each isotope that nature does. So the normal abundance for carbon is 98.4%, 98.8% carbon 12, 0.4% carbon 14 or carbon 13, and very, very teeny, teeny amount of carbon 14. So we can keep this ratio between carbon 14 and carbon 12 constant, right? It's very, very, very um, low. So once the organism dies, the ratio decreases because most of your carbon-12 is going to, well, let me see. So most of your carbon-14 is going to decay. That's why it decreases. So carbon-12 will probably stay the same, but your carbon-14 will decrease. That means that the ratio decreases. And then from that amount, using a scintillation counter, a Geiger counter, you can detect, probably they use scintillation counters for this because it's more um, sensitive. And you can detect the difference between the normal amount of the normal ratio and the new ratio. And that can determine how long, how long something has been dead for. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the carbon-14 carbon turns into carbon-12. It decays, and it could decay into other things, but mostly carbon-12. So you're right. Well, no, you mean alpha decay? No, it wouldn't. So no, it would decay. So it would decay. Of, it would take a couple steps. It wouldn't go one from the other because, yeah. Um, but it, it could release a, a neutron just in one step. So there's different ways for it to get there, but it could happen. Yes. Yeah. So the carbon-14, probably the most common mechanism is it, 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 it decays into carbon-12 eventually, and that decreases the ratio. So, and then you can calculate that ratio. Okay. So it's basically how to do it. So about after nine half-lives, which after which radioactive carbon can be below background. Okay, so after nine half-lives is where we can't detect the age of something anymore because that's over 50,000 years and you can't detect it. Okay, so an ancient bone contains one eighth of the amount of carbon-14 found in living organisms. How old is the bone? Sebastian's hand is up first. Yes, the answer is C. And online we do not concur. We, oh no. C. Yes, we have. Okay. V. Brian says V now. All right. Okay. So, C, okay. Let's talk about C. So, um, you can think about it if you have a more of a math mind, too much math for today, maybe, but two to the third. That's basically what we're doing here is so one half to the third. In a, in a, so, one half to the third means you're one halfing it three times. So if you want half something three times, that's one over eight. So that means one of the one eighth of the original sample will be there, meaning three half lives, and three half lives is seventeen thousand years, probably. But one half to the third. <laughs> Whatever, however your mind works, that's great. That's, that, that, you do that. It's got you far. Good. Either way, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's other ways to uh, to detect the or calculate the date of objects. So you have for extremely old objects like volcanic rocks and things that are about the age of the Earth, we use the we monitor the decay. 
Oh, he, he said, you do you, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we can detect the decay from uranium-238 to lead-206. So lead is atomic number 82. That's where it becomes stable again. So that decay from uranium to lead, um, from any volcanic sample, we can detect that and see how old something is. And then we have other ones. We have krypton, or not krypton, or potassium argon dating. Um, so let's talk about nuclear bombs and stuff. That's good. We can talk about that. Yeah. Yes, lead or less than lead. Yeah. 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 That's crazy, right? Yeah. So in infinite time from now, everything will be lead or less. You mean you mean uh, sorry potassium, yeah. I thought it was an I thought it was R, but it was a slash, so it's potassium. Yeah, krypton argon is way different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So um, nuclear fission and fusion, they are both used in atomic bombs, but the most the strongest one is nuclear fusion from hydrogen bombs. So we'll talk about both. The nuclear fission. When a large molecule, such as uranium, plutonium, they split into small nuclei and they release neutrons, they release alpha particles, mostly alpha particles. And um, this happens when a high energy neutron bombards with it and kind of ruptures it and then and causes it to decay quickly. Then you have fusion, which is taking two small nuclei and bringing them together, such as um, deuterium and hydrogen, for example, to make tritium. So here we go. Um, both fission and fusion release enormous amounts of energy, but fusion is more energy. So fusion is when you have the thermonuclear bomb, that's hydrogen bombs. All right, so here's nuclear fission. So you have a neutron it is bombarding uranium. What happens? Uranium nuclei explodes. And it creates a couple things, barium, krypton, and new, neutrons that are expelled with great kinetic energy. These neutrons will then, in a bigger sample, bombard neighboring uraniums, which would then create a chain reaction and then go boom, big boom. Right. So that's nuclear fission for you. Um, fissionable material, usually we use uranium. Um, and then we can have the enriched uranium which is when we uh, when we concentrate the uranium two thirty five using like you could do that with like um, with different like mass spec devices that collect and then we can enrich uranium and then using the enriched uranium that's what we use for bombs because we want it all to, we want all the isotopes or a larger percentage of it than one percent because the natural abundance of uranium 235 is one less than one percent so in a nuclear reactor that'll that'll work because we want that energy to be released slow over time but if we want a, a bomb we want maybe 10 percent or 20 percent enriched that's going to do us that's going to do us pretty well or it's going to kill us pretty well um yeah the, the chain reactions so here's what i was talking about before where you have your neutron and it bombards into your nucleus and it creates a chain reaction. Then now it releases three more neutrons, which have a great kinetic energy, which is then that chain reaction is carried out and things go boom. Cool. So we can watch a video. We could do that after the chapter. We'll watch a video on, on the on the bombs and like how they how it works. Because there's like a whole big, there's like a big schematic with the there's like a, a chamber and then there's the the one piece of uranium and it hits the other one and then that causes the chain reaction to start. So we can talk about that. We can see a video on it. All right, so nuclear power. Okay, so here's, we're gonna be, this is what, controversial, I guess? I don't know. Um, so nuclear power. Um, so our nuclear power plants are fission reactors, obviously, because we don't wanna use fusion reactors. It'll be, huge things will go boom yeah no so well 
All right, well, whatever. Um, so nuclear fission reactions, about 20% of the US energy is nuclear energy already, which is good. I mean, so theoretically, let's talk about the truths and the, and the, and the fakes. And uh, Sumi, yes, I will explain. So we'll, we'll look at that in the video. We'll look at that in the, in the video later on. Um, okay, so ideally, we want nuclear power. Why? Because it's cleaner. The power itself is cleaner. It doesn't create any direct toxic effects to the environment. And it's, it seems like it's free energy. But it's not, obviously, but because we have to do, we use a lot of energy to make it. But the main thing that's, so that's the theory, that's the theory about it. The main thing that's, that's the skeptics are saying and that it's um, actually kind of true is that there is radioactive waste involved, right? And when you have a large amount, let's say we switched over to 100% nuclear power. We're basically going to replace all the waste we have with radioactive waste, which is worse. I don't want to have radioactive waste that you make Chernobyl of it and your cat will have two heads. My cat, my cat will have two heads. Um, I don't want that. Well, we could shoot it into space. Yeah, but you could. Yeah, we can. That's not that's not that's an idea. Yeah, they do. Yeah, you have there's different places in the desert where they bury it underground. But still, like for the long term health of the planet that's not good um yeah so then you have another problem is nuclear power plant leaks which we've seen at the uh, fukushima disaster in japan and chernobyl is the big one so we've seen these um, nuclear reactors um explode and they went through a meltdown nuclear uh, meltdown and that's not good. And that can kill a lot of people from explosions. But we could talk about the less, the, the silent killer, which is um, Toby, of course, from The Office, right? You're, you forgot that. Joke. You're the silent killer, Toby. Um, anyway, so some of these nuclear power plants, they leak. And they, and they leak kind of like a, carcinogenic levels of radiation, but it's, it's constant, it's constant leakage. And a lot of them in the U S up to, up to like 50 or 60% of them do have um, some radioactive leakage. So that happens. And that's, that's the, probably the biggest threat in my opinion is that yes, we're ready for nuclear energy, but do we have the facilities to properly contain it? And the answer right now, I don't think so. I think there needs to be a, a couple more big innovations in nuclear power plant technology in order to not have any risk of exposure to anyone. And until that's seen, I think the radio, the, I think the nuclear power where it is, is okay. Probably a little, even, I think, I think it's too much, but we should definitely not expand anything until we have that technology. So, um, our production of nuclear power is ahead of our safety. So yeah, we can do cool reactions, but can we wear goggles and gloves? Not yet. Um, isn't Japan trying to dump nuclear waste into the ocean? I'm not sure. I don't know. That what? yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna comment now. I don't know. Maybe, I don't, I don't know, maybe. Godzilla, yes. It will make Godzilla. You know, maybe we should dump stuff in the ocean too. We'll make Godzilla. Yeah. All right. So here's a nuclear reactor. So you have the the way it works is you have um, really all it is is you're generating heat. And with these nuclear reactions, you generate a lot of heat, and that heat turns water into steam. And that steam powers turbines, and that turbine creates electricity. That's how really all the energy is made. And um, nuclear reactors are no different. We're not going to talk crazy about that. So core, nuclear core meltdown, here's the problems I was talking about. So you have um, water loss from the core. The, the, if you have your water, the water that's being heated up to steam, if that leaks out, then the reactor could melt down because the heat can't be dissipated anywhere else. 
and ends up kind of frying the, the, the machinery and it actually breaks out. And that radiation could then, I mean, could potentially over, uh, overheat and melt the lead and the um, concrete containment of the nuclear reactor, which eventually leads to a meltdown. So that's not good. And we've seen that happen before. And then the other one was waste disposal. So it's tough to do. I mean, where we put this stuff? Yes. No. Well, they can turn it off. There's like in the in the in the the thing. In the thing. <laughs> it's a long day. Uh, in the in the reactor, yes, you can turn it off. But if you have radioactive high energy particles that are released, the neutrons, they're going to keep firing. And they're gonna keep, and that's gonna be a chain reaction that keeps going until it's done, until it dissipates. And radiation does dissipate. So theoretically, that makes sense, but maybe that's that's something you could do for your your project. Your uh, senior, do you have like a senior thesis that you need to do? Like, yeah, do that. Um, <laughs> it is a bunch in New Jersey. Um, so anyway, uh, energy, other things. So. Um, Here's something fun. Here's a fun fact. If you take the mass of the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons in an atom and add them together, you do not get the mass of that atom. You get a little bit less. The reason why is because there's this thing called the mass defect. And this means that when you go through any radioactive decay. The sum of the parts are equal to less than the whole. And that's because energy. E equals mc squared. That's why, Einstein. So that extra mass, or that extra kinetic energy that, that, um, that powered the subatomic, the neutron from the, like we talked about before, the uranium releases the neutron, the three neutrons. The kinetic energy driving those neutrons velocity came from mass. It came from the mass defect, which is calculated E equals MC squared. That's the only way we can relate mass to energy. And then that's the mass defect. So every AMU, so let's say we have about one AMU for a neutron is about 931 uh, megavolts, and um, that's equal to 1.6 10 to negative 13 joules. And basically, we have uh, the greater binding of the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable the nucleus. Yes. So the greater the mass defect, the more stable the resulting nuclei. And that makes sense because it's releasing more energy. It goes to an energetically more favorable state. So just know that when we have these reactions, the basic point of this is that there is a mass defect when you have radiation or when you have radioactive decay. So here's an example of the mass defect and you can calculate the mass lost actually. So the mass of the reactants, mass of the products, you see there's a difference and that difference can be used in E equals MC squared to calculate the amount of joules of heat lost. So that's pretty cool, you could do that. Um, so then we can talk about nuclear fission, or sorry, fusion. So fusion is the combination of two lighter nuclei. And this is the basis for hydrogen bombs and also the energy for the sun. And it produces 10 times as much energy per gram as fission does. So it's, it's very high energy. Um, but it requires a lot of energy to initiate the reaction, which is probably why which is main reason why, or one of the main reasons why, it's not a efficient energy source to use a fusion reactor because you need to put in a lot of energy in order to get something out. So the yield isn't very good um, because you're usually, when you're dealing with small protons, dealing with small atoms, you have very close proton to proton contact with nuclei of small number of protons, which they're very finicky, you know, um, with the higher, mass atoms, maybe there's some of them even 10 or 20 stable, or not stable, but um, stable for a minute, stable for a little bit, um, isotopes. But for the lower mass ones, there's maybe one or two. So in, in hydrogen's case, there's three. Here's how it happens, is you can have, 
deuterium tritium fusion. And where you have a tritium, which is hydrogen with a mass with uh, two neutrons, and then a deuterium, which is a hydrogen with one neutron. And they bombard together. And what they make is this, this, uh, this is going to be um, helium with one extra neutron. Helium doesn't like that at all. So that one neutron will be ejected at a high velocity. And helium, which is an alpha particle, will also be ejected at a high velocity. And that will continue, and that cascade will go on and create a ton of energy. So nuclear transmutation is just the general term is when one atom is transferred, transformed into another one. It's not really super important. Um, so there's different types of particle accelerators. I mean, really, I don't really know much about particle accelerators. I mean, you can, it's just a lot of these, this theoretical work on discovering all of this stuff is done with particle accelerators. So you can bombard singular neutrons with larger atoms and see what kind of radiation is released from that. And there's different types, there's linear accelerators, and then there's the bigger one, like in um, CERN, is the cyclotronic um, accelerator. So um, you can just, you can bring protons and neutrons to almost the speed of light in this. And that's where you, they discovered the Higgs boson, things like that. Um, so yeah, okay. So let's do a practice problem. We're almost done with this. Um, Californic, Californium 252 is bombarded with a boron 10 nucleus to produce another nuclide, nuclide and six electrons. Which nuclide forms? Good. So basically we're taking 252 plus 10 because it's being bombarded with, with boron 10 to create 262. Then six neutrons are emitted. So 262 minus six, 254, and that's you could do Lorentzium 254. Boom. And if there was like Lorentzium 254 and something else 254, you can use the proton number from boron plus the proton number from californium and add those, and that would be the element. Well, I mean, on the PR table. Well, you don't know that. You know everything else. You know the half life of, of, of radium. Of radium. Okay, so now we can get into my domain of radiation is in life. So why do we consider radiation to be um, carcinogenic? And it's also anti-carcinogenic at the same time. So how can this happen? Well, radiation is just not a good thing for life. It's very bad. So the reason why is because it's, it's an ionizing force. Now let's look at DNA. I'm gonna draw now. Let's look at DNA. So we're gonna take a piece of DNA and we're gonna unwind it. Or we're gonna we're gonna do this so far. We're gonna we're just gonna draw it like like this. Right? So when you're replicating your DNA, which is the most important step to reproducing cells and and living, I mean when you age, so why do we age? Let's get to this question. Why do we age? We age because every repetition of DNA replication, transcription, translation, where we make new cells, new proteins, and new metabolic processes, it always degrades over time. And it degrades over time because we have mutations, an increasing amount of mutations, and which, which lead to a degradation of the mechanisms that keep us alive. That sounds really morbid, but it happens over time. And we can't avoid it, but we can by eating antioxidants. I always remember that, um, and and healthy lifestyle. So, how does this relate to radiation? So that's how we age. Now, when we get cancer, these mutations they collect. It's not just one mutation; it's maybe like four or five. And then you get specific ones, which are called driver mutations. So. One of the proteins that I talked about last week in my research is one of the driver mutation proteins that leads to cancer in, if you have that protein mutated in a cell, most likely that cell is gonna be cancerous and it's gonna have an uncontrolled cell growth. So let's say that how that happens is, let's say you have some DNA damage occur and there's like a, a, a methylation here, right? There's a methyl group. And we'll learn about that when we get to the organic chemistry. 
well, a methylation at this base pair. What's going to happen is DNA replication happens and you have RNA polymerase comes along, these proteins, and they go across the I had to get rid of one of them. I'm sorry. All right. Um, so they when they when they go across, what happens is they get other DNA nucleotides, nucleic acids, or nucleotides, and they replicate the strand that's unwound, right? So they they add these base pairs, and then you at the end of the day you do the same thing with the other strand, and you get uh, two double helical strands from one, right? That's replication. But when you get to a point that has been modified, the DNA, the RNA, um, or the, uh, sorry, uh, DNA polymerase doesn't know what to do. This is, sorry, not RNA polymerase, DNA polymerase, doesn't know what to do. So what it does is it either skips it or other proteins come in to try to repair it. Now, sometimes they can repair it, sometimes they don't. That's not the point. Point is an accumulation of these will lead to the DNA not being its old self, will lead to the DNA not being able to repair itself and either does one of two things. One, it goes anyway, but it has a lot of mutations. Or two, it destroys itself and the cell dies, goes through apoptosis, or controlled programmed cell death. So what radiation does is if you have radiation exposure, it will go to your DNA and it won't bind to your DNA, but it will ionize specific It'll ionize specific atoms on your phosphate backbone, your di phosphodiester backbone. And what it will do, or your sugar, your uh, sorry, your um, ribose backbone. And what it'll do is it'll create sites on the DNA that are easily manipulated by different attachment groups, like methyls or acetyl groups or different kinds of modifications. And these modifications lead to what I just said, which is a uncontrolled or dysregulated DNA replication, which then leads to a DNA, a, an unregulated proteins being produced, which then leads to possibly cancerous proteins being produced or other genetic effects like weird diseases or uh, weird um, deformities. So that's why if someone is pregnant and a, um, a nuclear reaction happens nearby or when an Indian Point Energy Center explodes or something, that's not good because that baby is growing and, it, and it's, and for a, a fetus, DNA replication, transcription, translation is happening, happening extremely fast, much faster than it is for us. So those iterations will be a lot quicker, meaning a lot more mutations can compile over that time if there's DNA damage. So, um, That's, that's the real reason why if, if you're pregnant, it's not good to do any really unsafe or like, al like alcohol consumption or really anything that's deemed as not healthy. It's not good to do because, oh, it's bad for the baby. Well, why is it bad for the baby? Because of this, because the baby is going through a much more rapid DNA replication than we are. And th if we have, if we have a, a drink of alcohol, we're not going to wake up with like a, a with a, a, a different kind of, of a syndrome of some kind. But a baby might, because that DNA is reproducing or, and replicating, those cells are replicating very quickly. And the more mutations you have, the, the worse their outcome is. And those, also those, um, not to diverge any further, but those cells are gonna be the foundation cells and the, uh, the stem cells of major tissues and major organs. So that makes it even worse. Whereas ours is like, I mean, we replenish our skin, we replenish our internal organ stuff or cells, whatever. Okay, so we talked about that, it may result in death, bad. And we use radiation to kill cells. And with concentrated radiation, we can kill any kind of cell there, any, anything that's alive, we can kill. And that's, we use that for, um, for, for killing cancer. Okay, so we talked about that already, genetic defects. Um, measuring radiation. So there's different ways to measure radiation. And we talk about um, really the rad. I mean, these units, these units, I guess the rad is important. A gray, nobody really uses unless you're in healthcare. 
that much. Well, uh, I never see, I never used it. Um, really, I've used the rad, and I've used. That's about it. There. Um, yeah, I'm gonna use this. So measuring radiation exposure. Don't really worry about this. We're not gonna. It's not too big of a deal. Um, so here's some radiation sources and doses. So a five-hour airplane ride. So that gives you a little bit of radiation, not too bad, because closer to the, you're about 10,000 feet up. So 